Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where each week, Pastor Jeff Cranston explores biblical theology that provides practical life applications in an understandable way. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston. We're seeking not only to help you know deep, solid biblical theology, but to know the word of God and the promises of God that are given to us in his word. And I have a review to share with you all today that was so encouraging to both dad and myself. LAL77 wrote this. Thank you for taking any Bible topic and putting it into bite-sized pieces. As that is one of our goals here at Kitchen Table Theology, it is so great to hear that from you. Thank you for writing that review. And that's our goal for today, breaking up a big book of the Bible with a lot of theological themes in it and putting it into bite-sized pieces. So let's dive in. We're going to investigate the Old Testament book of Daniel today. So much to unpack here. But Dan, I know you're going to do your best to do exactly what we just said there, bite-size pieces, something for us to walk away with at the end of this podcast. So before we jump in, let's just give a little bit of review. The Old Testament prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Habakkuk were right on. The Babylonians had attacked Jerusalem just as they prophesied would happen. They carried off thousands of Jewish captives, and one of them was the young man we're going to study today named Daniel. And Dad, Daniel's probably familiar to a lot of us. He was an incredible man. He quickly distinguished himself from the other men of Babylon. He was loyal to his God, wise beyond his years. He even interpreted visions and dreams accurately. Daniel's gifts were from the God of Israel, his God. And this young man became a living testimony to his God in a strange and foreign land. The book of Daniel also has vivid, symbolic visions about the future of Israel, of world kingdoms, of the kingdom of God. He really exposes us to some of God's long-term plan for the world. So we have so much to cover today. Dad, let's get it going. Yeah, and hello again, Kitchen Table Theologians. Thanks for uh, joining us today. And Tiff, you're so right. This is an incredible book. Uh, In a book many of us have known since childhood, as you said, a very incredible man was Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, we see him go from being a young man, most likely a teenager, uh, to an octogenarian. How do you like that word? Octogenarian, that simply means somebody (laughs) in their 80s. So we we see him go from teen years to uh, in his 80s. Pretty incredible. Let's start off with learning a little bit about who Daniel was. We maybe know a little bit already, but give dig a little deeper there. How he found himself in Babylon. And Dad, maybe you can clarify if he was actually the author of this book that bears his name. The title of the book is Daniel. Is he the author? Well, yeah, Daniel's book. And we believe Daniel to be the author. Yes. He was a product of his time in Babylon as a young Jewish exile from Israel. And while still a young man, Daniel traveled to Babylon with a group of, oh, I, you, you maybe could call them Israelite nobles, young men of promise, whom the conquering power, Babylon, once they realized who these guys were and their giftedness, said, hey, they could be of useful service back in Babylon. And we've talked about the Babylonian captivity a number of times in previous podcasts as we've gone through the Old Testament. And it appears Daniel was among some of the first to be removed from Israel to Babylon, along with tens of thousands of other Jews. And once Daniel arrived there, he was given a new name, Belteshazzar, in an effort to, I guess, more closely identify him with Babylonian culture and this new home of his. And Daniel lived there throughout the Jews' 70-year captivity. And he eventually rose to become one of only three administrators, you know, sort of as provincial governors in the kingdom. So he he rose to a very, very prominent status. Thankfully, he recorded his experiences and 
the prophecies that God gave through him for the Jewish exiles, those people during his time in the Babylonian captive, where because he served the king at the level he served the king, it gave him some really privileged access to the highest levels in Babylonian society. Very faithful service to God in a land and a culture that was definitely not his own makes him unique among almost all the people of of Scripture. Daniel really does stand out as one of the only major figures in the Bible to produce a completely positive record of his actions. And by positive, I mean he just didn't paint himself in a positive light, but uh, we can positively identify and historically identify what he's talking about. He was very accurate in names and places and so forth. And we just have this, again, from his teens to his 80s, with this long historical record, and, and he was spot on in everything that he wrote. And also, he's one of the only authors in Scripture where we're privy to the recorded story of the majority of his life. That's what you just said. We meet him at the beginning of this story. He is a teenager. And then by the time the book ends, he, we find him in his 80s, which is incredible through his whole, the majority of his life we get to hear about. So we know that this pl- takes place during Babylonian captivity. But how about giving us a little bit more background there for those of us who are keeping a record on our timeline? I know I have mine right over here. (laughs) Um, But maybe give us some dates, a little bit more background to help us understand where exactly this is taking place in context of the Old Testament. Yeah, well, the the Babylonians exiled the group containing Daniel and his three friends. And there, there were three separate times where they exiled Jews to Babylon. This was the first. And we know he had at least three of his close buddies go with him, and we we know them best by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are taken to the city of Babylon in 605 BC. So th- this goes on, that happens, and here the teenage Daniel finds himself in the midst of a strongly polytheistic religious culture, meaning He had ample opportunities as a follower of Jehovah God, plenty of opportunities to fall into error and to walk away from that. However, he stood very firm in his faith among the Babylonian people and to the Babylonian king, actually, on several significant matters, including dietary regulations and worship practices. But Daniel held strong. Time out for just one second. Let's go back to a word that you mentioned there, polytheistic. That's a word that we might not all be familiar with. That with. So can you tell us what that word means? Oh, yeah, good. So there's an, an easy question for once. It's, I love the easy <laughs> question. Uh, polytheism is very simply defined as the worship of more than one God. That That's it, more, worshiping more than one God. The Jews, as Christians are monotheistic, meaning we worship one God. For Christians, we worship one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Daniel and the Jewish people were thrown as monotheistic worshipers of the one true God of Israel. They're thrown into what must have been for them a very confusing religious culture, to say the least. Since we know that all of this is taking place during the Babylonian captivity, and you gave us the date for that, can you give us a little insight into when Daniel would have written this book? I did some research, and I can see just from a little bit that there is some disagreement over dating of when the book was written. There are those who believe his predictive prophecies are so correctly detailed that they find it hard to believe he was actually prophesying hundreds of years before those prophesied events occurred. Yeah, look at you. That's good. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. Scholars have debated the dating of the book of Daniel for centuries. Uh, Most conservative scholars would date the book around 540 to 530 B.C., some say that can't be certain, 
but they do put it in the 500s. Other less conservative scholars argue for a day in the 160s BC. So there's a big difference there. Many believe it was written in the 500s, the middle 500s. Some say around 160 BC because, and here's why they say that, because Daniel describes events down to about that time. So in other words, if Daniel is in fact writing around 540 BC, he's describing the events that take place in around 160 BC. Well, how do you do that? So chapter 11, specifically those predictions are thought to be too detailed to have been given, you know, three, 400 years before that. My own personal argument for, for dating it, uh, or uh, let's see, my argument against for dating it in the 160s, is that Daniel couldn't be the author then because he would have been dead for hundreds of years. I'm not I'm not sure how right. we, we're missing that part. <laughs> for him to write it in the 160s means he would have had to have been alive then, and he's, he certainly wasn't. And if, you know, really the, the bottom line is if Daniel did not write the predictive prophecies in the book, then the book's claims lack the integrity demanded of one of God's inspired prophets and would have faced enormous difficulty being accepted as scripture by the Jewish people. It would have never made it into the Hebrew Bible. And without correct prophecies, Daniel would not have been God's prophet. It it was real easy to determine who was a prophet. Did they say something years ahead of time? And did that thing come to pass? I think for those of us who believe in an inspired, infallible Bible. We have no problem at all with dating this book into the 500s BC. Perfect. Let's go ahead and jump in before we run out of time into some of the theological themes that are found in Daniel's book. It's not a super lengthy Old Testament book as some are. Some of them are so long. This one only has 12 chapters, but it contains so much and there's a great deal of theological truth in here. So dad, what are some of the themes that stand out from the book of Daniel? Yeah, I wish I wish we had, you know, numerous podcasts to spend on Daniel because you could we could easily <laughs> spend an entire year doing this weekly in, in the book of Daniel. And there's so many incredible stories, uh, just that. But let's yeah, we're we're kitchen table theology, so we're going to talk about. We want to know what the theological themes are and all of these. Well, so I would say first and foremost, really, the main theme of Daniel is God's sovereignty, that the sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign over the world is a theme found throughout scripture, but it's also at the forefront of the book of Daniel. This, this theme begins from the very first verses in chapter one. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem, took Daniel and his three friends captive to Babylon, and the writer, it is clear, the writer is clear uh, what, in what we read. He says, it is the Lord who handed King Jehoiakim into the hands of the Babylonians. Jehoiakim had only just been named um, king of Israel. He, he hadn't been in that office but for a few weeks. And all of a sudden, he's carted off to Babylon. But The writer, Daniel, says it's clear. This is the Lord's hand. The Lord's doing is in this. It was the Lord that gave favor to Daniel, gave prosperity to the four exiles. It's the Lord who protected them, gave them advantage over all the other exiles being trained for service in Babylon. All of a sudden, these four, you know, they they rise to the top. The Lord gives Daniel special abilities to interpret dreams. Uh, You just see the sovereign hand of God in every chapter of the book. That's the God's sovereignty is one of the, is, is I think the main theological theme. And I imagine that theme, this, that message would have been extremely comforting for Jews in later centuries um, as they found themselves living under the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, really at any point in their history, it'd be comforting to look back and read the story of Daniel and be reminded that God is sovereign. Because we do know from our Old Testament history that the Jewish people thought they were going to return to Jerusalem. They thought that God was going to restore that ki- their kingdom to them. And that's what the pro- prophets promised. 
but the restoration was not happening exactly as they expected it. They went from submission to the Babylonians, then to living under the Greeks, and later even to the Romans. Yeah. And, you know, what the prophets promised has come true, is coming true, still in some of the prophecies is yet to come true. But the Jewish people had a different idea of what that was going to look like. Um, and that you make an excellent point. It would be very easy for a Jewish truly in charge of the world events. So, you know, how could God allow the Babylonians to destroy the temple of God in the most holy city of Jerusalem? I mean, how was that happening? That's the complaint of Habakkuk, one of the prophets who questioned God's use of the Babylonians to punish Israel. And yet Daniel presents God as raising up the empires and humbling them according to his will. But yeah, you're right. I think it would have been comforting though. You just think, you know, and there's still a lot of people walking around on this planet today who lived during the time of the Holocaust and World War II. And the Jews, what are they holding on to during the Holocaust? Um, You know, those who remain faithful to God, you know, you have to rely on God's sovereignty that although we cannot and do not to this day understand all of what happened, God is still sovereign and he still has a plan. And much of which is, is still yet to be seen by us. Okay, so we can certainly see how the sovereignty of God, that theme is portrayed throughout the book. What other theological themes pop up in Daniel? Well, the second theme, I think, just plays on what I just said. God cares about the suffering of his people. That's another theme of the book. God cares about his people's suffering. There are several stories in the book presenting Daniel and his friends in difficult dis- uh, situations where their faith is tested. And there is a potential for suffering uh, in the very first chapter. Uh, Daniel chapter 3 and chapter 6 put the characters to the test in life-threatening situations. There's a fiery furnace. There's a lion's den. But in each case, God protects them, uh, even though they're willing to die rather than break the important boundaries of their faith in God. And I think those are some of the best love stories in all the Bible. That's, you know, the stories that we teach our kids. Uh, Daniel's three friends will always be, in my mind, thanks to VeggieTales, Rack, Shack, and Benny. <laughs> but let's, let's not digress. Let's keep going. What's another theme? Pride leads to blasphemy. Pride leads to blasphemy. There, there's another word for pride that I really like, and it's the word hubris. And hubris simply means excessive pride. And we see taught in the book of Daniel, hubris, excessive pride leads to blasphemy. Let's take a quick little pause right here. Can you explain how should we understand blasphemy to be defined? I know we've probably heard that word from time to time, but I'm not sure that we know exactly what it means. So give us a definition for blasphemy. Yeah, so we'll do this quickly, parenthetically. Uh, blasphemy is the act or the uh, offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or things that are sacred. The hubris of rulers in the first half of Daniel, those uh, Babylonian rulers, becomes blasphemy in the latter half of the book. You know, God, we, we see he controls the coming and going of kingdoms. But, uh, you know, in the first half of the book, we learn about that. In the second half of the book, the, the battle moves from earthly to cosmic. And the, the greater picture here where evil will one day finally be defeated. And of course, this is pointing us to Christ. Uh, and, and so, uh, these rulers, uh, it, their, their, uh, pride, excessive pride led to blasphemy which ultimately led to their downfall. And it will always, that's always the case. And that that theme comes out of the book of Daniel. Okay, since you've mentioned events that will take place at the end of the world as we know it, uh, which will lead to a new heaven and a new earth, perhaps we should just take a second and remind ourselves that whenever we read Daniel, we have to keep the book of Revelation close by. Those two are so closely related. 
That's very true. There's a lot of correlation between Daniel and Revelation. And in my undergraduate days, I took a class. We simply called Dan Rev. And we studied both, uh, both books. Excuse me. We studied both books side by side because they often describe the same events. And we will get to Revelation hopefully in a couple of weeks here on the podcast. So oh. you've got that to look forward to. <laughs> What podcast? Yeah, there, here we go. We'll, we'll give it a, we'll Here give we it a, go. Get there. All right. As we wrap up today, let's end with this question. What What is our takeaway today? What is our bite-sized piece? How can we take what we've learned here from the book of Daniel and apply it to our lives? Well, what do you think? Daniel and his God-fearing friends were forced to live in Babylon, far from home, far from the land the Lord had promised them. Later in the book, Daniel prophesied of terrible trials still to come in the promised land. And whatever those trials were coming and whatever trials they had undergone thus far, it was always because of, of sin. It was the consequences of sin. So kitchen table theologian, have you ever endured the weight or consequences of sin and felt as though God had left you behind, that your sin had exiled you, so to speak, that you feel maybe God had stranded you in a world far from the comforts that you had grown accustomed to. Well, the, the book of Daniel paints a portrait of how to serve God faithfully in the middle of that kind of existence and how to persevere in hope, even when there does not appear to be immediate solutions to the problems that get us down. Daniel would remind us, stay in the game, Keep plugging away, stay faithful to God, and in the end, God wins, and he has our best interests at heart. Thank you so much for listening today, Kitchen Table Theologian. If you enjoyed this podcast, we really would appreciate if you'll just take a second and leave a rating or review. That really does help us get the word out to other people. Don't forget, you can check out today's episode notes and more at jeffgranston.com. You can also email us anytime. It is Pastor Jeff at LowCountryCC.org. As always, thanks are due to our friends here at Low Country Community Church in Bluffton, South Carolina, and at Streamline Podcast for making this podcast possible. Next week, we have a surprise for you. We are going to pause our Bible overview series because we think it's time for a quiz. We no. have covered a lot. Oh, well, no. <laughs> no. No, I'm like, yeah, love quizzes. Love quizzes. Yes, we have covered a lot in the both the Old and the New Testament books. So be prepared next week. You're going to be tested. Your memory will be tested. Let's see how much you can remember, how much we have learned as we've been going through this Bible overview series. Until then, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. Thanks for joining us at the table. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, please check out our show notes. If you have a question from today's podcast, kindly email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's Word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.